शक्ति हृदय तुम्हें मा भक्ति बहुते तुम्हें मा शक्ति हृदय तुम्हें मा भक्ति तुम्हार प्रतिमा घरे Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Pondicherry to um, see this. Can we have the AC sound off because it's a bit noisy? Um, if the air conditioning can be switched off, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, what you just heard is the, are the uh, third and fourth stanzas of Vande Mataram. The first two, as you know, is our national song. But the th uh, there are three more stanzas. Uh, the third, fourth, and fifth. This was the third and fourth. This is important because the, these are the stanzas that were very often sung to the gallows by the revolutionaries when they were being hanged. So these are important uh, stanzas. They were sung. This particular version was sung by my uh, put together by my younger son Dhruv and by my wife uh, Smita. Uh, and the idea was to give you a flavor of why this. First of all, many people don't even know uh, and never heard these stanzas. Uh, and when, they, uh, when you hear it, you can clearly s feel the power of these words. These are very clearly uh, derived from strong shak shakta imagery, i.e. from the, the shakti tradition of Hinduism. And I'm going to start with this because in many ways, people in, 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 in misplaced uh, idea of uh, secularism forget the enormous um, influence that the uh, that Hindu revivalism had on uh, the freedom struggle. Do remember what we are dealing with here. After the great revolt of 1857-58, uh, uh, all the traditional uh, resistant traditional elite resistance to British colonial rule had basically fallen apart. Right? Um, Indians generally had accepted that the British now ruled the country. There were the odd revolts here and there by Birsa Munda in what is now Jharkhand or by the uh, Manipuri elite in, in 1890 or thereabouts. But really there was no serious resistance to British rule. And in that situation there was a great feeling of civilization being under threat and religion being under threat. This was a very important part of the conversation. In fact, Lala Lajpat Rai writes in many of his writings that <coughs> the youth in the 1880s, 1890s, that's all they talked about. And out of that milieu, many responses came. Some of the responses were social reform type responses that you, that you at least hear about, like for example, the Brahmo movement and so on. Uh, but what is less talked about is the power and imagery of Hindu revivalism that becomes a very important thing in the 1890s. Now this shows through in many, many ways. One of them being, of course, Tilak's uh, revival of Ganpati Puja. Now Ganpati Puja is not a new thing. It was in the Maratha period an important festival. But by the, uh, by the late 19th century, it had become a very minor uh, festival which was done at home almost apologetically in a world where missionaries were always ranting against idolatry. And Tilak basically brings it out forefront and revives it as a way of mobilizing uh, people against the British. So the Ganpati Puja uh, uh, that you see uh, in Maharashtra, but now more widely, is uh, very much a modern construct, uh, obviously drawing on a more ancient tradition, but a modern construct for political mobilization. Now this happens in various ways as well. The Arya Samaj is another uh, uh, driver of this. But <coughs> in many places, a major part of this driving force was uh, drawing on uh, Shaktiism 
as, uh, uh, as a source of inspiration. And we just heard before this session, uh, the session on Durgavati. Uh, so uh, it is important to remember that these image, image of Durga, Durga as such finds its way in many ways uh, into, the, uh, the, uh, mm, uh, into the imagery of the freedom struggle. Now, out of this comes um, the uh, armed resistance to British rule. Now, of course, there had always been armed resistance to British rule, going back to the beginning, whether it's in the 18th century uh, resistance, uh, the early 19th century from the Marathas, the Sikhs, and so on. But the revolutionary movement that starts out at the turn of the century is a thoroughly modern movement in some ways. Uh, it, it is not an attempt to go back to the past. Uh, the revolutionaries were very much into creating a modern India. They were modernists. Uh, they wanted a democratic republic uh, or based on universal suffrage. In fact, it is the uh, revolutionaries uh, rather than the Congress which thought of India first as a democratic republic based on uh, universal suffrage. The Congress, till basically the end of the 1920s, was still basically demanding at best small concessions and maybe dominion status. But the revolutionaries also drew upon an earlier era of resistance. Shivaji particularly was a very important character in their sort of mental uh, uh, map. And, um, and of course, as I mentioned, Shaktism. And this happens, of course, you can hear when you hear uh, the uh, 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 Vande Mataram, uh, it, you know, many Muslims refuse to sing it, saying that it is a, uh, a, 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 a it's dedicated to Durga. Uh, it is, uh, because it is very much derives from Shakti iconography. Uh, in fact, Durga herself and, and all the all the, 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 uh, the Tripura Sundari, i.e. Durga, Lakshmi and Saraswati are explicitly mentioned as a part of that song. Uh, <coughs> and then, of course, there were the initiation rites of the revolutionaries. Um, most of the revolutionaries, when they were initiated into the movement, they would go through this rite in which they were swear to fight for the liberation of, mm, uh, of uh, uh, Bhavani Bharati. Uh, uh, and they would do it in front of an image of a form of Shakti, whether it's Bhavani or Durga or Kali, holding a Gita or other holy book in one hand and a sword or revolver in the other hand. So this is a very important thing to remember because we are in a city where in some ways uh, the intellectual uh, font and father of that, uh, uh, of, of this resistance uh, came to reside and uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo. Uh, of course, he was then called Aurobindo Ghosh. Um, unfortunately, uh, the role of Sri Aurobindo or Aurobindo Ghosh uh, as the father of, uh, of our freedom struggle, and specifically of the, of the uh, revolutionary armed strain of, uh, of our freedom struggle, has been largely forgotten, very often ignored even by his supposed followers. But in fact, he was the father of, uh, he was one of the fathers of our freedom movement, and he was specifically uh, the intellectual font from which the uh, revolutionary uh, movement drew its inspiration. Now, sadly, after independence, the story of India's freedom struggle from the armed uh, uh, lineage uh, was deliberately suppressed. Um, it happens not surprisingly because uh, another group, another lineage of the freedom struggle, the Nehruvian lineage, I wouldn't call them the Gandhian lineage because they, Gandhi died very early in the, in the, in the uh, story. Uh, but the Nehruvian lineage came to power and they systematically tried to increase the importance, their own importance in the, in the story. That's human. But what is not, uh, I think, uh, uh, excusable was the fact that they then went and deliberately tried to suppress the story of what the revolutionaries in particular had done. And this is sad because of, <coughs> uh, 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 and particularly the s systematic way that it, this is very sad because as I will, as some of you have already started reading my book uh, about the revolutionaries, the revolutionaries actually were an extraordinary movement involving tens of thousands of people 
keeping up armed resistance to British occupation over half a century. This is not a some small group of people as you may get the impression from reading our history books. They, the history books g haven't completely wiped them out because this is very recent history. So you can't actually wipe out the memory of Subhash Bose or Bhagat Singh or Chandrasekhar Azad or uh, Savarkar and so on. But you will get the impression from that that, you know, okay, there were these occasional acts of resistance, um, heroic, etc. Let's them give a pat on the back. But in fact, had no uh, uh, impact on the overall uh, uh, unfolding of history or of the freedom struggle. This is absolutely not true. And as I've tried to show through the, uh, my book, the, you cannot even understand the nonviolent movement if you do not understand the armed resistance. In fact, inside the Congress itself, the uh, revolutionaries had a very powerful uh, voice. So much so that uh, um, the revolutionaries were able to elect their own, i.e. Netaji Subhash Bose, to the presidency against uh, the explicit opposition of Mahatma Gandhi. So even within the Congress, the revolutionaries were a very powerful bloc and were could, quite capable of uh, winning elections. Incidentally, this wasn't just about Subhash Bose. This has happened many occasions before. One of those occasions, of course, Sri Aurobindo was involved. This is in the Surat uh, 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 session of the Congress, um, where uh, <clears throat> we are now told, those who at least uh, have uh, delve into that period, be told that there was a lot of friction within the Congress uh, between the so-called uh, extremists and the so-called moderates. The use of those terms itself is interesting because you get the impression that the likes of uh, Lal Bal Pal were somehow extremists because they were demanding f independence and uh, the moderates were nice reasonable chaps because they were asking for small crumbs from the British table. So. In my book, again, I have tried to change these terms and in fact use terms which Sri Aurobindo would use for them. <laughs> the Lal Bal Pal and of course he was from that same group uh, and an important person in that group by the way. Uh, Sri Aurobindo would call them the nationalists and he would call the opposing team the loyalists. So if you had to rewrite this history books, you would begin talking about that period and the tussle within the Congress as the tussle between the nationalists and the loyalists. Which brings me to another point which comes, hopefully will come through in my book, is the role played by <coughs> a large group of people who I call collaborators, who actually collaborated actively with the British. After all, at even the peak of British rule in India, there were only a few hundred thousand of these people an even smaller group would have been armed, few more ability in the administration. So they were at no point in time were there very large number of uh, uh, British officials, army and other people to be able to dominate a country of our size and our population. The reason they were able to do this is because there were always was a sizable group of people who were collaborators. And sadly again, very little is written about these col this collaborator class. Do remember that when f firing was ordered on, uh, 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 on Indian protesters and freedom fighters during, let's say, uh, the uh, naval revolt of 1946, within living memory, incidentally, then the firing was very often, I mean, the firing was, of course, done by uh, Indian police or troops or whatever. but. Even the ordering was very often done by young officers of the in Imperial Police Service. So there was, and these young officers of the Imperial Police Service were Indians. Do remember this. So Indians have repeatedly collaborated with foreign occupiers to perpetuate our subjugation. This happened during the Turco-Mongol occupation of the country. And <coughs> Nandini was talking about it earlier. This also happened incidentally during British rule. And ironically, even after independence. So this is one of the very sad parts of, if you read the epilogue of my book, 
And I'm going to talk a little bit more before we open it up for Q&A, I think because I think some of the conversation will be much more interesting in a Q&A. But one of the things that comes through very clearly is that independence happens, the Nehruvians come to power. Yes, one, of course, they deliberately suppress the contributions of the revolutionaries. They slowly nudge them out of the history books or sort of present them as sort of random acts of individual violence. But what they do further is actually inexcusable. They, I don't know if you realize this, that when you visit the Port Blair and you see the cellular jail, what you see there today is just two wings of the cellular jail. But it was a much bigger complex with many other radials. What happened to those other radials? Well, they were pulled down. In fact, even the ones that you see today were nearly pulled down till at the last minute it was stopped. And therefore, you have this little bit of it saved so that you can go and see it and remember what was done to these people. This memory was almost entirely wiped out. Same thing, ha similar thing was attempted and successfully so in many other places. I'll give you another example. Delhi, Mamsi, Maulana Azad Medical College, yeah? It is built on the site of Delhi jail where many revolutionaries were hanged. In the 1950s, it was decided that this jail would be closed and there were, uh, now there are many other places to build uh, 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 college, but they had to be built on that site. Okay, fine. So when this was done, some old, there were still some old revolutionaries left. Unfortunately, so they went and t told the government and Nehru himself that look, at least the part where the hangings used to happen should be converted into a memorial to the revolutionaries. This Nehru agreed, the government agreed. But then when actually the construction started, they demolished it and there is now a building on it. So this is how the memory of the revolutionaries was simply wiped out of, uh, of our national uh, sort of consciousness very, very de deliberately. And instead, what happened is you see, for example, the INA uh, soldiers. They were not only not taken back into the Indian Army, they were not even given freedom fighter status for many decades afterwards. It's only in the 1970s that you know, there was, they were finally be given some recognition as freedom fighters. Many of them died in penury. Uh, this also happened with uh, <coughs> uh, the, the, uh, the mutineers uh, of the Royal Indian Navy uh, revolt. Uh, they all, many of them also were never, none of them were ever taken back into the, uh, uh, into the Indian Navy. And again, many of them died in extreme penury. And this happened systematically, by the way, to many of the revolutionaries. And this is all, this again brings me back to what happened to them. Do remember the three provinces, of course, there were revolutionaries across India, but the three provinces that provided, uh, three communities that provided the bulk of the revolutionaries, remember what will happen to them too. One was the Sikhs and Hindus of Punjab, Hindus of Bengal, and specifically the Brahmins of Maharashtra. These are the three communities that had provided a disproportionate number of the revolutionaries. And each case, see what happens to them. In Punjab and Bengal, they are partitioned. So at the moment that India became free, the revolutionaries who had sacrificed so much for India's freedom found that they themselves were foreigners in their own homes. So not only at the time of independence, you may ask, why, weren't the, why didn't the revolutionaries manage to you know, have a voice in post-independence India's politics? Well, this is what happened to them. All their top leaders were gone. Not a single one of their top leaders survived till independence. With Netaji went missing, died, whatever your belief may be. Uh, Raj Bihari Bose uh, and Sachin Sanyal, uh, Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad, all of them were dead. So the revolutionaries had no leadership and their homes had been lost. East Bengal and Lahore were major hubs of revolutionary activities. And if you read my book, you will find Dhaka and Lahore, etc., mentioned repeatedly. Uh, the, the revolutionaries themselves were completely leaderless and they were homeless also. 
And even in the case of Maharashtra, look at what happens to them. Using the excuse that Godse was a Maharashtrian Brahmin, the entire community was essentially faced uh, genocide in some ways. So we all know about the eight, 1984 uh, riots in which the Sikhs were targeted. But do remember something very similar happened after Gandhi assassination. The entire Chitbhavan Brahmin community, more generally the Maharashtrian Brahmin community was targeted. Hundreds were killed, their homes were burnt. And we never hear about this genocide. A lot is talked about Savarkar. Let me tell you about what happened to his younger brother, Narayan Savarkar, who was a, who was a great um, freedom fighter in his own right. I don't know, is Vikram here or not? Vikram Sampath, he's probably outside. But you can read more detail in his own, in his book, although I mention it in mine as well. Narayan Savarkar was dragged out of his house and stoned to death. He, di he died, he would then be essentially be in hospital for almost a year, never recovered and would die. Godse was hanged for the death of an assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. I want to know who was hanged for the killing of Narayan Savarkar. In fact, Vinayak Savarkar himself narrowly escaped the same fate. A big mob of Congress workers, great believers in Ahimsa, turned up at his house. And, it, and he was there with his kids, young kids, etc., and his wife upstairs. Thankfully, the mob was delayed long enough for the police to arrive. Otherwise, the same thing would have happened to him. And we hear long stories about how he was ap apologetic to the British and, and so on. Why were the Congress workers so afraid of this other narrative? So much so that to this day, they will make up utter bullshit stories about how he was in some way a collaborator of the British. If he was a collaborator of the British, they wouldn't have kept him in Kalapani, I can assure you that. They would have kept him in the luxury wing of Naini Jail. And they would not have kept him in house arrest for another 13 years in Ratnagari. So this story of the revolutionaries was not merely about the story, their, their history of resistance being suppressed, but what happened afterwards in the way in which the, they themselves were pushed out of the, of the national conversation systematically. The provinces they came from were divided and partitioned. They became homeless and leaderless. And even when they were not suffering partition, they were targeted specifically, in, as, you, as I told you, in the case of the Chitpavan Brahmins of Maharashtra and pushed out of the conversation because they were seen as a threat to the continuation of a particular narrative. So why did this happen? Why did independent India end up with this continuation. It happened because once the Nehruvians had come to power, they discovered one, they had to push out other alternatives to their hegemony. And one of the groups they decided to, uh, co uh, to uh, take on board was, remember, that collaborator class. And of course, the collaborator class was very, very happy to be on board. Because now, you know, they, of course, they were, of course, always good at collaborating. That's what they did for a living. And they were wondering what to do with themselves. And here was an opportunity for, con for continuity. So as the British officials left, those who had collaborated and joined the administration in various forms, they were the one who benefited the most because they had got promoted and went up the stream. And it is they and their descend immediate descendants and direct descendants who became the administrative and intellectual elite of India after independence. This is the reason where you have a peculiar situation that the colonial era narrative that India was never a nation, never a country, etc., was continued because, you see, this was very important for what the collaborators were telling themselves. 
in any independent country, they would have been thought of as being traitors. But of course, if you could say that India was never a country before 1947, then of course, they could never have been a traitor to a country that did not exist. So it is very important to their own narrative that India is not a country, is not a nation before 1947. That is why it is important to say Gandhi is the father of the nation because then 1947 ke pehle kuch nahi tha. Then you can have Chacha to the nation. <laughs> then you can have Damak to the nation. So this is the importance of that narrative. And also remember that a large number of British official, colonial officials continued to serve in the government. It is not that the next day they throw in ICS officers of Indian origin continued, but also British origin. Much of the Indian <coughs> armed forces was run by British officials well into the 50s. The first Indian naval chief only took office in 1958, 11 years after India became independent, in the name of continuity. So in the name of continuity, this entire regime continued. That is, therefore, the collaborator class below them also continued. They were very happy. And they, they were large. So you, when you go and dig a little bit, just do a little bit of digging, and you will be surprised how many people who are from this so-called uh, sort of uh, uh, this uh, intellectual class have their origins in people who were, who made their money by becoming contractors to the British or whose direct ancestors were working in the in Imperial Police Service. Just go and look it up. You'll be shocked. Just do a little bit of Google search and you will, you'll be shocked. So of course, this particular narrative is important to this collaborator class. And many of these collaborator class then became the story writers about the whole thing. I, I have in my book, I've given the specific example of Yashpal. Those of you who read Hindi literature will know that he's considered among the great icons of Hindi literature. And ironically, he made his name by writing about his contributions as part of the revolutionary movement. Now it turns out there is more than adequate evidence to show that he was actually a police informant. And it was based on his information that Chandrasekhar Azad was trapped in Alfred Park in what was then called Allahabad and, and, and to kill himself. Even better, the revolutionaries of that time were hunting for him. I know that members of my family were hunting for him. And so because he were hunting for him, they, the British actually faked a gunfight in which nobody got hurt, interestingly. In, and then he was arrested and put in jail. I forget which jail, Bareilly or some such place. Now, no self-respecting revolutionary was ever sent to, to Bareilly jail. They were sent to Kalapani or Gonda or some such place. And even better, he was allowed to get married in jail and keep his wife in jail with him. So, these are the people who after independence then took on this mantle and became great, remembered as great uh, revolutionaries or great writers and thinkers and so on. Also interesting is what happened to many of the remnants <coughs> of uh, British uh, intelligence operations against the revolutionaries. So again, let me give you an interesting insight into this. Many of them have interesting afterlives. So for example, during the First World War, <coughs> or a little bit before the First World War, there was a very large movement called the Ghadar Movement, which involved a big network inside India, led by Raj Bihari Bose and Sachindranath Sanyal, but worldwide as well by likes of Lala Hardayal and, and many others. And the Sikhs were a very important part of this, particularly Sikhs in North America, who were operating out of a network of Gurudwaras, also in other places, UK, Singapore, etc., but particularly North America. 
Now the British basically decided to break this movement by infiltrating those Gurudwaras. And they actually, we even know the name of the British agent, Hopkinson, who was the person put in charge and was given a large amount of resources to infiltrate the Gurudwaras. And so he infiltrated those Gurudwaras and he created again a bunch of collaborators. And their basic premise or their aim was to create a split in the Sikh community and specifically spew venom against the Hindus and split them off from the Hindus and also from uh, the nationalist Hindus, uh, uh, nationalist movement in general. Now do remember at that time, <coughs> the Gadarites were aware that this was being done to them. And in many of the Gurudwaras of North America, there were gunfights between the collaborator loyalists and the nationalists. Uh, gunfights and the Gadarites then began to systematically kill the people who they being British informants. So then what happened? Of course the Gadarites fight back and many of these informants get killed. So one of these informants was Bela Singh who turns up in a Gurudwara and shoots a, a couple of people dead. And it is seen by many people and there's a court case and everybody knows that, you know, the British will ensure that uh, this is happens in British Columbia, by the way. So everybody knows that the British Columbia justice system is going to somehow find a way to free Bela Singh. So the court case is going on and Hopkinson is supposed to come and bear witness on behalf of Bela Singh. So when he is entering the court, the, the witness box or whatever, an, a Gadarite Sikh called Mewa Singh stands up, pulls out a revolver and shoots him dead in court. Now, nobody in India knows the story. Nobody in India probably has heard of M Mewa Singh. But these were the kinds of people that were there. Now, Bela Singh, despite, of course, Mewa Singh is captured, he's hanged. Bela Singh, of course, is exonerated. But he knows that they are hunting for him. So it eventually it becomes so difficult for him to live in British Columbia, he actually escapes back to Punjab, which is he thinks is safer. But then he is ultimately, I think, hunted down in Hoshiarpur and killed by the revolutionaries. But sadly, this infiltration of Gurudwaras continues even after the death of Hopkinson. And in case you're wondering, why is it that Canada of all places is the hub of the Khalistani movement, well, let me tell you, the, the founder of the Khalistani movement is Hopkinson. So, this is how this entire thing starts out. So, there are all these remnants. Another interesting thing that is often forgotten is that <coughs> till about 1930, there were virtually no revolutionaries who had anything to do with Marxism. When, you know, very often you will hear, oh, the revolutionaries were Marxists. Actually, no, they were not. Uh, many of them may have been today considered Hindu nationalists of anything. Bhagat Singh indeed became in the very end of his life, and by the way, it couldn't have been a very li long life. He was only 23 years old when he was hanged. But the, towards the very end, he did embrace uh, some, some amount of Marxist ideas. But it's interesting that in his very famous tract, Why I Am an Atheist, he himself writes that I am literally the only Marxist in the entire movement. In other words, his movement was not Marxist. The top leader of his movement, Sachindranath Sanyal, was vehemently anti-Marxist, as was Raj Bihari Bose and many others, and Sri Aurobindo as well. So, the movement and its leaders were anti-Marxist of anything. So it's only in the 1930s you begin to see some Marxism sort of begin to spread in the revolutionary fold. And that happens interestingly. One is of course <coughs> some part of the, 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 some group of revolutionaries ended up in Russia after the First World War because they had nowhere to escape and they were indoctrinated by the Soviets into this. So that lean and therefore uh, you have the CPI being formed in Tashkent. But even that is not really the source of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Marxist movement in India. 
The real source of the Marxist movement of India is very, very curious. And again, I have collected lots of interesting evidence of this. It comes from British jail, jailers handing out Marxist literature to revolutionaries in British jails. Now, why on earth would they be doing this? Now, it, this is interesting. And again, as I said, there are many examples of this, of the British jailers giving out these, because they wanted to cause a split in the revolutionary movement and wean them away from the nationalists. So they thought that communist literature was a good way of causing a split. Now, am I just coming up with some sort of a conspiracy theory? No, there's more than adequate evidence that this happened. Also interesting is that now that these people had become communists, where did they end up? They ended up in the CPI. Now the CPI had been formed in Russia, but in the 1930s it was functioning in India. Interestingly, under the control of British double agents. We even know their names. One of them was called Rajni Palme Dutt. Please read up on him. Okay, Rajni Palme Dutt grew up in Cambridge. He was half Swedish. By the way, related to Olaf Palme, he was killed later. And a Bengali he was he and his brother were very much involved in the communist movement in, in, in Britain. But it's quite interesting if you read his correspondence with various people, including Nehru, it was very clear he was serving British interests. And of course, this became a very useful thing because in the Second World War, the communists would collaborate with the British against the revolutionaries. Now, yes, there were some revolutionaries who did take on Marxist ideas, but continued to be suspicious of imperialist uh, and British and Russian uh, interference. Now that lineage of the revolutionary movement wasn't in the CPI. It ended up in something called the Revolutionary Socialist Party. Now that party has almost died out today in modern, in today's India, but was a reasonably um, uh, uh, large party uh, into the 50s, 60s, even into the 80s. So the Revolutionary Socialist Party is the remnants of uh, that lineage of, uh, uh, of the Marxist lineage of the revolutionaries. They were originally called the Anushalan Marxists, of deriving from the Anushalan Samiti of, of again, Sri Aurobindo. But another, it's interesting, on the very other end of the ideological spectrum, the other remnant of the Anushalan Samiti is, guess who? RSS. The RSS was founded by Hegewer, who was himself the Nagpur head of the Anushalan Samiti. Uh, he, had been, he, had, he was very much a part of the Anushalan Samiti. He was in National Medical College in Kolkata. Uh, he started out as being a courier for guns and other literature and other things, and he had, interestingly, a code name, Cocaine. Uh, anyway, he comes back, he does various things during the First World War, trying to instigate revolts. Ultimately, he leaves uh, the mainstream revolutionary movement and he sets up the RSS. Uh, very interestingly, and I'm going to end with this, the pamphlet or the design of the RSS uh, is again derived from writings of Sri Aurobindo. Please read a short 18-page pamphlet called Bhavani Mandir. Have you read? How many of you have read Bhavani Mandir? There are a few here. Read it from end to end. It's only 18 pages, and you will immediately see where the, f the, the, the uh, broad design of the RSS comes from. Um, with that, let me stop and open it up for Q&A. Uh, such an interesting talk, Sanjeev. Just a quick question. There has been an attempt to say that Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose was himself uh, socialist, if not, you know, didn't have Marxist ideas. What is uh, your take on that? So Netaji was essentially a pragmatist. Uh, we don't, he didn't have very strong views on, mo, uh, on how society should be arranged, although he did participate in creating a planning board in the Congress while he was the Congress president. 
But if you read his own writings, it's quite interesting how he thinks of the right and the left. So in his own writings, and do remember that the term socialist did not have the connotations of economic economics that we have well into the 1930s. It was a generic term that many people used, even though you wouldn't call them socialist or the left. The idea of socialism was anybody who kind of, or, or the left, was anybody who was, had kind of radical views about uh, pushing back against the existing colonial order. So in his own writings, you find Netaji refers to the likes of Lala Lajpat Rai, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Sri Aurobindo, even Vivekanand as belonging to the left. So be very, very careful about the use of the term left. Left meant radical, not necessarily associated with um, sort of all these terms that we now have of a particular kind of economic planning or, uh, uh, social, uh, or secularism and so on. The left was a generic term, so many of the characters who we now consider from the right, would have, he would have considered from the left. The term socialism as a, itself was a very vague term. By the mid-30s, it does begin to take some forms, particularly because of the uh, the growth of the Soviet Union and so on. So you begin in the 30s, beginning to see some sort of contours of what we would recognize as socialist left. Um, but again, it would have been quite vague. There were many people using all kinds of uh, terms more generally about it. So be very, very careful about using it. And in any case, uh, Netaji himself was a pragmatist. Um, I mean, if he was that ideological about it, he wouldn't have uh, been willing to ally either with uh, the, the fascists of Italy or Nazis or, or imperialist Japan and so on. Uh, he was, as far as he was concerned, his first agenda was uh, freeing India and he, he was willing to ally with whoever was necessary uh, in terms of doing so. He was not at all ideological about it and of course in personal life he was a very cutter shakta, that is well known. Thanks for the mind-boggling session. I have two quick questions. One, I'm very happy that we are waking up now, but are we too late? Second question, uh, Anand and Vikram Sampath were talking about how Gandhi was a fiction. And even his contemporaries were, you know, uh, they were promoting the Mahatma picture. Why was so? Even Patel didn't uh, agree with, no, though he didn't agree with him, he budgeted for uh, giving space to Nehru. Why so? So, of course, there's a great amount of deification of, uh, uh, of Gandhi that happens um, while he was alive and, of course, very much after his, his assassination, which, was even, which, by the way, was quite convenient to us uh, also to uh, the narrative. Uh, so the building up of Gandhi is uh, very much a uh, part of what happened. But do remember that within the Congress, forget the revolutionaries, there were many, many others who were quite uncomfortable with Gandhi's deification. Since you mentioned Sardar Patel, let me tell you that included Vithal Bhai Patel, who was his elder brother, who was quite suspicious of Gandhi. And, uh, it in, uh, and there was an entire faction in the, Gandhi in, the 19, in the Congress in the 1920s called the Swarajists, who were uncomfortable with Gandhi, which included C.R. Das, interestingly, it, and Vithal Bhai Patel, but it also interestingly included Motilal Nehru, Nehru, uh, Motilal Nehru's switch over to the Gandhians happens in the end of the 1920s and it happens interestingly because Gandhi first helped him to become the president of the party but then also arranged for his son to be his immediate successor. In a sense he was bought out as a result of that politicking. This is exactly what Gandhi tries to do with Subhash Bose as well in the 1930s. That's why, by the way, the first time that Subhash Bose becomes president, it's actually with Gandhi's blessings. Where it goes wrong is that Subhash Bose, having become president, first of all, doesn't toe the Gandhian line in what he does. But then, uh, in, and then he says, look, my, what I've been doing hasn't yet been finished. I want another term. And that is where it, you know, the friction comes from. So, I am not here to say that Gandhi did not have any contributions to the freedom struggle. That would be too extreme. 
there were many contributions to the to the freedom struggle and gandhi even many of the revolutionaries accepted that he had a contribution by the way whether you read sachin sanyal's writings or even uh, netaji's writings but at the same time they were not so enamored by him to think that everything he did was right and sort of deified him they saw him as a an important political leader who was part of the whole spectrum that led to indian freedom yes so it's really exhilarating uh, whatever you are telling but the point is that ki this literature would be read by most probably the people like us uh, who are no longer going to school when these things are going to come to the school i have a kid who is in 10th standard actually mai uska kitab padhta hu to hin bhavna se bhar deta hai bharat ke bare mein so when this is going to happen another another question just short uh, it is also said that nehru informed about uh, the presence of uh, the revolutionary who was killed uh, in that bag uh, is it true because he had just met nehru just before he was killed for asking for money well nehru did indeed uh, know that uh, chandrashekhar azad was in alabad on that day so that is true but we do not have any direct evidence to suggest that he had provided that information the best evidence we have is that it was yashpal and another guy uh, i forget his name something tiwari uh, but mostly yashpal who provided that information so th that is the best information we have so i am not going to uh speculate until i find some other new evidence on this matter as far as textbooks is concerned well i have been pushing for this for a very long time uh, so i can't comment on the activities of another ministry or ncrt but let me say that i have been pushing for it for a long time i am told that they are on the job Sanjeev, thank you. Coming back to Netaji Bose, uh, what is your take on on Gumnami Baba? Uh, so I just wanted to know. I mean, I'm just trying. Well, to I actually don't have a particular view. I'm intrigued by the idea of Gumnami Baba. Um, I wouldn't completely uh, write it off because he was a very interesting man, uh, Netaji, and he was quite capable of doing something like this. Uh, and by the way. he had in earlier life once run away from home to become a monk so he was capable of doing something completely uh, out of the box but am i somebody who spends a great amount of time thinking about this uh, no uh, the reason for that at least as far as my book is concerned do remember that uh, for the purposes of my book he is not his after life is not irre relevant he for for as far as the freedom struggle and the revolutionary movement is concerned whether he goes missing or dies in that plane crash subsequently he doesn't seem to play an important role or at least we don't seem to have any evidence of him playing a, 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 an important role so consequently i take take an agnostic view about the matter whatever happened to him as far as the story is concerned he was dead hand because otherwise i wouldn't know whom to give the mic to one more question from me since yeah. you are part of the government and the revolutionaries uh, are coming out in the book as a part of azadi ka amrit mahotsav uh, what are the steps that the government is taking to uh, elaborate the contributions of our revolution so many things are being done i mean some are small some are big but certainly what we have done is as part of the azadi ka mahots uh, amrit mahotsav we have celebrated a much wider array of freedom fighters than would have been the case in the last 75 years so whether it's in terms of putting a netaji statue on kartavya mark and you know if you go there and see it effectively what happens is that all subsequent republic day parades are done effectively to netaji taking the salute um similarly if you have visited kolkata and gone to the victoria memorial and visit gone to the insides of it you will see that it's been converted to being biplobi bharat museum which is to netaji and the other revolutionaries and i had some small role in getting that done um there is um similarly we are finally beginning to hear uh, uh, names such as birsa munda mm, and so on who are an important part of the conversation uh we ma many people 
are completely ignorant that the Manipuri had a very important role in our freedom struggle. They were probably utterly ignorant about it. Uh, they put up the last, yeah, just, yeah, they put up the last true um, resistance of any Indian traditional elite to the British in the 1890s. And the Manipuri royal family was then sent off to Kalapani before cellular jail was created and they were put in a place <coughs> what for a long time was called Harriet Hill. Just a few months ago, uh, Home Minister went to uh, Andamans and he renamed that hill as Manipur Hill. <laughs> Similarly, there is a cell, there, was, there has been now for some years a cell in, um, uh, in uh, cellular jail that was dedicated to uh, uh, Savarkar. There now is another cell that is now dedicated to Sashyendranath Sanyal, who had been sent there twice. He's the only uh, person to have been sent twice to Kalabani. <laughs> Went for five years and then subsequently for ten years. So small things are being done, but in some ways this is not a government effort. This has to be a national effort and it is coming through in many, many small ways across the country. Even the movie RRR, fictionalized as it may be, brings out the memory of Aluri Sitarama Raju. Many peop of people in this room may have never heard of him before this. And while I don't think he went to the governor's party and danced like that, uh, it is a fact that he had a very remarkable life and a remarkable resistance to British colonial occupation of this country. So I think we are, these stories are coming back. And of course, there is a longer history of uh, resistance to uh, foreign occupation of this country. That too is coming back. We are now beginning to hear about the likes of Lasit Borpukon or Durgavati and so on, which we simply did not hear. Even Rajdi, with now his uh, even somewhat reluctantly is writing about Vijayanagar of all places. And maybe he has twisted, I haven't read the book, and I'm sure he has attempted to give it some secular twist. But the fact of the matter is people are unable to keep these stories hidden any longer. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You have four more minutes. Sajid, you have four I more have minutes. I have four more minutes? Yes. OK, OK, OK. So I can ask some more questions. Uh, uh, sorry, I can answer some more questions. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, there has been a rewriting of history in these days. Is this too late, or uh, is this the right time? There's no right time or too late. It's about, about every generation to go and dig. <coughs> the point is, proper scholarship is needed, first of all. Our purpose is not to replace one bunch of lies with another bunch of lies. So proper scholarship is needed. For the first time, this is being attempted. Some of it is happening in academia. Finally, archaeological survey is also being slowly uh, sort of uh, pushed ahead to begin to do new digs after a long time. You're also seeing people from the outside of the mainstream academic uh, histor history uh, mafia beginning to write books about uh, history, uh, of course, with great amounts of complaints that we have not been, uh, that, th that, that the, uh, the academia didn't have an opportunity to brainwash us, uh, and therefore that is taken uh, as a, uh, against us. But anyway, the point is, new facts are being dug up, being presented, these stories are being retold. And very importantly, these stories are finally beginning to reach the general consciousness as well. Look at the number of things that are being done. Uh, you know, Amazon Prime and o other OTT platforms have, for example, recently come Udham. Right? Growing up, I had actually never heard of Udham Singh. Hopefully, the next generation very much knows who Udham Singh is. I mean, and the incredible thing he did. Uh, he avenged um, Jallianwala Bagh massacre after two decades and so on and so forth. So these stories are coming out, whether, as I said, the, the, the specific period of the revolutionaries, but also the longer history. Um, there's a lot of renewed interest in, for example, Shivaji that is happening. Uh, <coughs> Uday Kulkarni has written extraordinary books on the Peshwa period. Um, you're beginning to see histories for uh, uh, being written about other characters as well. So I think there is a revival of interest in our own history uh, being written by ourselves. And uh, you know, uh, in the past, 
a book on Aurangzeb with no references at all in it would have simply passed through without anyone challenging it. Today, it's being challenged. And you also have a situation where even those who, for example, even today you'll find books of Charles Allen everywhere. I mean, I find it extraordinary that a country like India accepts a blatantly racist histories and books written by the likes of Charles Allen and they'll find them in ordinary bookshops. And I'm gonna end by saying this, just read a book he's written called Coromandel, okay? On the very first page, he writes something quite bizarre. So it's supposed to be a maritime history of the Coromandel course. He basically starts it, that chapter, by saying that the Indians are a strange people that ne live next to this ocean and had no interest in the ocean. What? <laughs> so in one fell sweep, he wipes out our entire maritime history. And then this allows him to only concentrate on the colonial period. I mean, the blatantness with which history is done. He's written a book on Ashoka, where there is a 20-page segment on Ashoka himself. The rest of the book is about how great the British were in having rediscovered him. I mean, it's just astounding. But anyway, that's how things are. For the first time, till a decade ago or so, we would just not have questioned him. In fact, he would have been brought to literature festivals and feted as a great Indo Indologist. Today, we mock him. That's the change. Thank you very much.